stopwatch. Stopwatch. All right, ready? Wait, wait, wait. All right, just point at me when you want me to start. Okay, buddy, you ready? Hey, hey, quiet. <clears throat> been my dream to teach class. Ever since I learned calculus in the ninth grade, I always had the desire of teaching calculus to other <laughs> students such as yourselves. And I'm, I thank you, Mr. Headland, for giving me the privilege of doing so. No problem. All right, so let's begin now. Calculus is based around two main questions. One is how do you find the instantaneous rate of change, and the other being how do you find the area of the curves. These are two completely different questions, but they're closely related. Let's go over them. First, let's start with the first question. How do you find the instantaneous rate of change of a function? Well, before we even begin talking about the instantaneous rate of change, we actually need to be talking about the definition of rate. In the real world, we actually define rate as simply being the change in distance or change in time. When we refer to graphs, we actually talk about the change in y over change in x. So suppose I have a graph. Two points, and I want to find the average between these two points. Well, what I would have to do is find the change in y over the change in x. <laughs> <laughs> in doing so, I'm actually finding the tangent line of the line connecting these two points. Let's go over some straightforward, straightforward vocabulary. We all know secant line is by definition, by definition a two line that intersects a function at two points. So that, what did we just find? We just found that the average of a function is equal to the sum of the secant line connecting those points. Now, we're not necessarily concerned with the average of a function. We're actually concerned with the instantaneous rate of change, not necessarily the average change. So what do we have to do? How about we know? I know what to do. You know what to do? I know what to do. So we're going to move this point closely. We're going to inch up to this point. We're going to approach it. It's all the way to the point at which they're both completely above each other. And when we left over, we're, we're left with a tangent line. So what does this stuff mean? This stuff means that the instantaneous rate of change is simply equal to the slope of the tangent line. Although, you realize in this case, the change in x is zero. It's, it's instantaneous. The change in x is zero. So we're left with zeros over zero, and that's known as it being a determinant. And we don't, we don't necessarily want zero over zero, because we can't work that, with that mathematically. So what do we have to do? What do we have to do? What do we have to do? I'll show this to you. We don't necessarily, we don't necessarily let delta, we don't necessarily let delta x be equal to zero. We simply allow it to approach zero. We inch up to it with a limit. We let the delta, we let the limit of delta t approach zero. Zero. In doing so, we actually define what's known as the derivative. The derivative being defined as the instantaneous rate of change of the function at one point. <laughs> so, actually, the ten plus takes a lot of practice. <laughs> the derivative is also defined by an equation known as Newton's quotient. It's also known as the difference quotient. It states that the derivative of the function f of x is simply. Newton's quotient states that the derivative of the function f of x is simply limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all divided by h. Now, of course, it looks like a very unattractive equation, which is the only difference between me and the equation itself. So what can we possibly do? <laughs> Don't worry, it's not necessarily just an ugly equation. It's just a slope. It's a rate. So, um, of course, there are shortcuts to finding derivatives. We can actually you know, use what is known as the power rule, which states that the derivative of the ver derivative of the variable x of the power of n is simply The derivative of the variable x to the power of n is x times n to the power of n minus 1. That's only used when we're dealing with variables to the power of something. Now, if we're dealing with a function that is defined as a product between two other functions, we actually do what is known as the product rule. But suppose f of x is defined as a product between g of x and j of x. Well, how we, the way we would find the derivative of that function is we simply find the derivative of the first times the second plus the derivative of the second times the first. Now, let's go over the, how we would find the derivatives of quotients. Suppose I have a function f of x defined by g of x all over j of x. In order to find the derivative of this, we'll have to use the quotient rule, which is mathematically the derivative of the top times the bottom minus the derivative of the bottom times the top all over the bottom squared. There we go. That is the essentials of derivatives. Now, what exactly can we do with derivatives? That's the question. Oh, wait, we forgot one thing. We forgot the chain rule. Suppose I have something like this. Here you can see we have a sign, a trigonometric function. So what do we do? What do we do? How to find the derivative? <laughs> we simply find the derivative of the outside first. The derivative of sine being known as cosine. We include the crap in the middle. <laughs> 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 so 
and then we multiply this all, all this <coughs> by the derivative of this crap, which just so happens to be 3x, 9x. There we go, that's the chain rule. You multiply by, you first find the derivative of the outside, then you find the derivative of what's in the parentheses. Now, what if we're dealing with something that's not directly defined, such as a circle? Do you realize this is the unit circle? x squared plus y squared is equal to 1. We would actually have to do what is known as implicit differentiation, which is by the we differentiate the entire equation in terms of dx. Carrying out the operations yields this. We, are, we will be using the chain rule on this one. We'll be dealing with the new variable dy over dx. And all that is equal to 0 because the derivative of any constant is 0. So no, do, now we're going to simply isolate for dy over dx, and we'll find that this equation yields dy over dx so you get a negative of x over y. There we go, that is implicit differentiation. Now what can we possibly do with the derivatives? We can actually analyze the graph, see what happens when the derivative is zero. When the derivative is equal to zero, we know the tangent line is going to have a slope of zero, so it can happen like this or that. That's what happens when the derivative is equal to zero. So what can we do, what can we do, what can we apply, what can we apply? We can apply that when the derivative is equal to zero, we actually encounter what is known as a maximum or a minimum. And we actually can use something what this tells us is we can simply find the first derivative of a function and we can look for its zeros. In doing so, we actually define what are known as its critical numbers, which are by definition, definition the points at which the derivative is equal to zero. So we can set up critical numbers and analyze the intervals. If we find that, that the first derivative has a positive sign here and a negative sign here, we actually find that this, the original function increases on that interval and it de de decreases on that interval. What's if we're concerned with curvature? Well, what do we do with curvature? So what we have to do with curvature is we actually deal with the second derivative of the function. In doing so, we actually find what is known as the point of inflection by finding the zeros of the second derivative. And in doing so, we can actually set up intervals again once more. But this time we'll be dealing with curvature. We can describe what is known as concavity. If it's positive, we know it's concave down, upward. <laughs> <laughs> second derivative, that's this known as the second derivative that's used to find second critical numbers. All right. Well, there we go. There's all of differential calculus, it's, or at least the essentials of differential calculus. Of course, we can talk about related der related derivatives, but you can do that on your own time. So those are word problems that nobody wants to make. Exactly. So now we have to look at what is known as integral calculus. In order to do so, we actually have to look at everything we just did, but backwards. So if we're given something like this, and we're asked. Essentially, integral calculus tells us find the derivative whose function is the find a function whose derivative is that function. That's a derivative. I mean, that's an integral. So, in talking about integrals, we actually go into what is known as the fundamental theorem of calculus. Suppose I have a graph, and I have this integral from a to b of this function f of x. The fundamental theorem of calculus actually tells us that the area of that region is simply equal to the definite integral. From um, a to b of f of x with respect, to, with, with, with respect to x. And what that yields is capital F x of b minus capital F of a. So what that tells us is, what the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us is that the area under this curve is simply equal to the antiderivative of the function at, with b evaluated into it, and subtracted by the antiderivative of, of the function with a evaluated into it. Using this knowledge, you can actually deal with quantities we encounter in the real world, such as velocity, acceleration, and jerk. You jerks. <laughs> <laughs> we, we simply define as velocity being the first derivative of the position function, and we also define acceleration as being the second derivative of the position function, which is represented with this no notion. And of course, we can go on. There's an infinite number of derivatives we can find, but most of them aren't useful. In finding, the indefinite, in finding the integrals of derivatives, we actually go backwards and find, as I said earlier, the function.